All right, so this is our presentation for this evening, Benefits of Telesupervision. I'm glad that a couple of you are doing um, telesupervision currently. I want to know also as a follow-up question, are you doing telesupervision with graduate students or with um, CFs? So are they still students or are they in the field? So again, you know, if you can put that in the chat, we can see that also. Um, again, this is a brief biography. I did introduce myself, so I don't want to bore you with the details. But, um, you know, obviously I am, as I said before, the owner of World Class Speech Services. I am on the New York State um, Licensing Board. And, um, and again, um, I do own World Class Speech Services. That is my own private practice. And I am currently working, as I said, for Mercy College um, as a clinical uh, director of clinical education. Um, I did work at Adelphi University. And while I was there, um, I established the telepractice practicum and research suite and created the course introduction to telepractice in speech language or speech for speech language pathology. So again, a lot of different um, ways that I've been working through the system. I see in the chat that we have CF and in the field and at clinic. So it looks like, you know, you have some mature, more mature students. In other words, the CFs are not necessarily brand spanking new clinicians, right? They have some, some clinical know-how already. And so when you're doing telepractice, or well, when they are doing telepractice and you're supervising them, um, they, they might have, you know, we have different regulations and different ways that we work with um, those clinicians. And again, because the title of this um, presentation is Benefits of Telesupervision, I didn't want to go too much into the technical details, even though I want us to be able to discuss them and talk about them. So again, um, as we proceed, I would love to hear from you guys as we you know, continue to, to um, look at what are you doing out in the field. So first of all, as I you know, said before, telepractice is not telesupervision. There are similarities, but there are differences. And um, of course, the similarities are that they are online or telecommunication for remote service or assessment. And what does that mean? I mean, specifically that um, we oftentimes think that telepractice is really only this audiovisual version of things, but technically we can do telepractice in a variety of different ways through telecommunications. It can be, as we know, synchronous, asynchronous, or a combination of both. Um, what synchronous means is I am talking to you in real time and you are re receiving the message in real time. So that is, you know, at the same time. And asynchronous means that we can actually do telepractice by recording and forwarding information. So whether that um, recording is through a video, which it can be, or it can be through an audio program, if that's what we chose to do. Again, it's a little bit um, you know, right now, I think that the majority of people are working with audio and visual components to their telepractice. So, and, and frankly, also the other way that we could work with telepractice over historically, that is, is that we can actually do telepractice by fax. So they allow for telepractice to be done by facsimile. Um, most of us do not do that for several reasons. One of them is most of us don't even have a landline. And the second of all, the person that's receiving it also has to have a fax. So in this day and age, most people are not doing that. Um, the other thing though, is, which is interesting is um, just thinking about the similarities and the telecommunication is that um, we also have to do it in the way that gets success as well as gets paid, right? So there are regulations about who um, can do services in any particular way. And, um, and in that way, how uh, Medicaid pays for services um, in theory for some things, how Medicare pays for services, they don't pay for as many things, um, but, um, but they, do, they can. And then of course, you know, if you're getting private pay, what the, the payer is going to pay for. So again, um, the, the telecommunications can be varied 
but again, we can do service or assessment through that. ASHA has approved both telepractice and telesupervision. Um, I want to say in the early 2000s, if not 2000 specifically, that ASHA put out the very first um, statement about what, you know, about, about approving telepractice. Um, and that in that statement, it also said telesupervision is not telepractice. So keeping that in mind, we just know that um, the idea is that um, practice includes the service and, or the assessment. And then opportunity to overcome geographical travel location boundaries. So that's been one of the biggest things, right? That um, they talk about how, um, and especially you know, over, over COVID times, people are um, isolated and in their own spaces and they cannot be in another place. So that happened. But additionally, um, we've had clients over the years. Um, I have a client in particular that I'm thinking about who um, was um, had aphasia, um, had a stroke, and had um, uh, left hemiparesis. Basically, he was um, somewhat limited in his mobility. He couldn't drive himself, which means that somebody else needs to bring him. And the fact that he didn't have to leave his house and get into a car and, you know, have to um, be transported from, well, frankly, it would have also been over an hour's transportation that each way, then, you know, it was to his benefit. To be honest, that's not the only reason that we should be doing telepractice if we are you know, talking about this and telesupervision. Um, there are reasons that, for example, if somebody was doing um, a type of service that is in their particular location, that they don't have anybody that they, um, that, that's close to them physically, um, geographically, that can come and see them, that they can actually have telesupervision instead. And those are specialty areas potentially, that um, maybe you are familiar with and that nobody else in their area knows that type of specialty service or intervention. So when we think about that, we think about the fact that both the client as well as the student or clinician, young clinician, new clinician, um, they, they all need kind of like this, this particular type of work that's getting done. So as as although location and travel is oftentimes the, the first thing that we think about, there are other reasons that um, telepractice and telesupervision are needed. And the more that these, um, as we know, these doors are opening to us, the more possibilities that we have to be able to reach across and help people that are doing what we know really well and can help them with. I think about that in, ways of mentoring, um, you know, student uh, CFs, excuse me, CFs specifically. All right, so the differences, of course, um, there are differences specifically, maybe in some of these um, are just definitions, but telesupervision is from the SLP to a student or a CF for training or mentoring purposes. And telepractice is to a client or another clinician for intervention or assessment reasons, right? So you can consult with another client, with another clinician um, because of the type of ass assessment or intervention that they're doing, or you can, um, you know, obviously do telepractice directly with a client. One of the other ways, by the way, that we talk about telepractice rather than telesupervision, of course, is when, um, and I've seen this mostly in medical fields, so telemedicine, telehealth, is um, working with hospitals that are international. So with um, new technologies and new interventions and trainings, there is the opportunity to be able to transfer what you know to the um, clinician in a whole other country and be able to share that information. So as we know, there are certain countries in the world that do not have as robust of a tell, uh, excuse me, a speech pathology or audiology um, uh, presence and they don't have as many professionals there. So as they are building and growing and learning and kind of in their field and, and we have the opportunity to be able to see things much more often, we can give them some um, 
some supervision in that way. So again, um, it's, it's, or sorry, telepractice, but you know, supervision sort of, <laughs> we can give them some, some of our insights in that way. And then um, I put LOL, one usually gets paid while the other doesn't. So, you know, telesupervision, um, if you are a CF supervisor, uh, a lot of people do not get paid for being a CF supervisor. They might get, I don't know, how many of you get paid for being CF supervisors or not? I feel like, especially with, um, you know, it's mostly a voluntary kind of thing. So um, let's see. Uh oh, anybody in the chat or want to comment on whether, whether that you're getting paid as a CF supervisor? Paid. <laughs> in thank yous. Yes, yeah, Suzanne, I, I hear you. It's, it's mostly in thank yous. And so, so unfortunately, you know, telepractice, God, God willing, you get paid for it. Telesupervision, unlikely, less likely. Um, I wanted to actually at this point also, because I brought up the other point of sharing internationally, is that um, I wanted to share where we can, uh, um, let's see, I'm a graduate student and I've heard our current supervisors not get paid. Correct. Just be nice to them. <laughs> be nice to them. <laughs> because no, they're not getting paid. And I wouldn't have known that either if I was a graduate student, when I was a graduate student, so I understand. All right, so we have um, these maps of where we can kind of supervise. And I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger for you guys so you can see this. So this is an updated map. I know I put a, a different map on, um, on the sisters page, but this is an updated map. It has more, more people that agree that super, telesupervision can happen. So clinical fellows can be supervised um, in most of the states now, except, which is interesting, it says that it is not permitted in New Jersey, North Carolina, or Oregon. Not permitted to supervise. Yes, I know. I'm, I'm looking at it like that too. Um, so I, feel, I find that to be unfortunate for those people that are there. I also, you know, I'm surprised about New Jersey because I would have thought our neighbor would definitely allow it. But, um, but as you see, uh, the blue color, blue green color is where it's permitted as far as telesupervision for CFs in speech pathology, right? So clinical fellows, telesupervision. Um, where the purple is where it's permitted for speech pathology, but there's no guidance for audiology. Um, the red is where it's contact licensure board, meaning you have to contact the licensure board to in, and indicates there's a possibility depending on the interpretation. And then it, the orange is no regulations contact licensure board and white not permitted. And the reason why, of course, you know, I just wanted to make sure I read the key is because most places have no regulations. Head up, heads up about this. This means that if you are supervising CFs, they are trying to get their license, right? That is the reason why they are CFs. They are clinical fellows so that they can move forward and achieve their licensure um, or and certification for ASHA, um, usually at the same time. So when they're talking about this, they're talking about New York State licensure boards and what we say. So I, again, I'm on the licensure board and our board does not have a say in whether or not you can supervise uh, CFs in telepractice, through telepractice. So specifically, in other words, they kind of are leaving it open. They wanna see what's happening. They want to, you know, kind of uh, uh, feel out the territory and see how many people are interested in what's happening. So again, keep, you know, as you as you work with your clinical fellows in the field, you should, of course, check out ASHA, make sure that you're following their regulations. But to, this is kind of a benefit. In some ways, the benefit is that if you are supervising student. Uh, students or clinical fellows specifically in New York, we don't really say anything. And so going to the student interns, we do the same thing. So this is when they're in graduate school and whether or not we can do, uh, excuse me, telesupervision for audiology and speech pathology this time, as you see again. 
uh, New Jersey is still not permitted. Illinois and Indiana <laughs> are in the middle and they are also not permitted in white. The rest of the states are generally either permitted or, um, or like I said, contact the licensure board as it says a couple of times or that they have no regulations. So again, some people have regulations, but we don't, you know, they, they could be interpreted in a couple of different ways. And then last but not least is um, the support personnel. Now we don't have, um, even though it says nothing is written in New York, we don't really talk too much about the support personnel, even though we probably should talk more about that. In other words, who else is in the room that clients might need? And how do we supervise and support them, right? How do we build their ability to be able to really do good supervision with the clients that we're working with? So it's interesting because most of us think only of the supervision happening with CFs or with student interns. And so I'm going to kind of keep that there. We only have an hour <laughs> to talk. Um, but when we think about it, we can also supervise personnel. Does that make sense to you? Is that like thumbs up? You, you get it? I'm gonna look at icons, no? Anybody? Any questions about this? Okay, Terry says thumbs up, she gets it. All right, I see something in the chat. So let me just make sure. Para educator, yes, personnel, yes. So a para can absolutely be the support personnel, absolutely. Parents, if you're doing early intervention, for example, and paras in the schools, absolutely. And sometimes home health aides, when people are in wheelchairs in their homes, um, adults, of course. Um, so yes, all of those people could be supervised technically, right? They're not supervised for hours or for money. They're supervised because that's who they are and that's what they're doing. Um, but again, thinking about that, we have to think about how we are training them or giving them the proper ability to be able to be as effective as possible and for us to be as effective as possible with their help and their hands on in there. So, yes. All right. The let's see, go back and going back to our PowerPoint slide. I hope I'm picking the right one. <laughs> All right, so training is increasingly important. Like telepractice, delivering supervision services from a distance requires additional knowledge and skills for issues such as managing technology, complying with licensure and security requirements, providing feedback and so forth. Training may be necessary, oh, sorry, training may be necessary for clinical educators regarding how to provide telesupervision so the quality and effectiveness of the supervision is equivalent to in-person service. And we talk a lot about equivalent to services that we would provide in service in everything we do tele. So again, it comes up here so that we understand or at least remember to consider how we are training the various um, constituents that need our services. Um, one of the things that, um, again, uh, ASHA has improved upon, frankly, in the last, well, literally in the last two years, because it came, um, became a requirement of supervisors to have actual supervision continuing ed unit, units um, in 2020. So same deal here is that Sometimes I've heard um, people that talk about telepractice and telesupervision, like, of course I can do that. I already know how to do that. I don't have to, you know, like, I don't have to train. I just, you know, open Zoom. But the truth about it is, if we want to be um, at a level that is evidence-based, or frankly, that is even within our, um, you know, scope of our our um, specialty areas, then we need training on doing that type of service online. It's better that way. It gives us more opportunities to be really good at what we do. We don't take for granted the fact that we need training in, for the sake of argument, dysphagia, and that we need to know how to do it properly before we start sticking things in people's mouths, right? So 
again, even though this is a means, uh, meaning a medium to get services to, uh, to the client, of course, um, and through our clinician, uh, you know, that is whether the CF or the student, the way that we do it better is when we know that we can kind of um, bounce ideas off of each other, collaborate, um, um, build through almost like trial and error as with most of the other things that we do, but learning and getting better with it. So again, training has to be part of what we think about. And that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm glad the sisters asked me to do another um, telepractice and, and in this time, tele-supervision training, because I do think it's important. I don't think that everybody can do it well. And I think that some people are doing it as good as they can do it, but not with any kind of knowledge base walking in. It's just, I'm gonna try and see how it goes but there's training out there. So again, I encourage you to continue to go to trainings and um, find out more about how to do tele-supervision because again, it can go, it can go either way. It can be really great. And it can be also just like with any other supervision, it can be not so great. And it also adds the component of technology and knowing that we have to have like right now, we have to have like multiple screens just in case one doesn't work, then we go to another one. Things like that are super, you know, it seems super simple, but it's really important to have that in your mind through, you know, through knowing that one laptop may not be the only way to do this. So, and then, you know, getting other ways. Again, you know, this is for the CS. I suspected that most of you would actually be um, CS, but meaning CS supervisors, but Again, just because I wanted to make sure that that we get a, a you know a, a rounding of things. I am on a university campus, so I'm always thinking of student clinicians. But I know that you guys have both potentially, as Terry was saying in the chat. And so, you know, keeping that in mind, I can you know hopefully give you a little bit more information. But what I did here was just to highlight some things because I don't love slides with a lot of words. I'm sorry that there are not enough pictures on my slides today. Um, I have been a little busy, but that's not, not an excuse. I, I, just, um, I just, for some reason, was focused on the content this time. But um, I highlighted that this is the CFCC, which is, um, geez, wow, I just blanked on their whole thing. But what it is are the people that follow before getting your C's. So the, they're the ones that set the rules for getting your C's. They say that they prefer, they per, the CFCC prefers that the six on-site and in-person direct observations per segment be completed on-site and in-person. Um, so notice I highlighted, I bolded, excuse me, and underlined the word prefers. So after that, it says there's an unpredictable nature of the pandemic. So they do take that into consideration. And so at times there's not, um, they have accepted, of course, um, uh, no on-site supervision for CFs, quite obviously, right? There was a whole year that we pretty much lost um, and weren't really able to get to see people in person and clients were also remote. So again, for that, all those reasons, that's, you know, kind of part of the deal. The um, clinical fellows may utilize telepractice provided an op appropriately credentialed speech language pathologist is available. So in that case, we, we are saying that um, the, 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 credential of the speech language pathologist is of course the same as with other supervisors. So as much as possible, um, you know, again, this is just a relatively new ASHA stipulation that we have to actually have, I want to say two hours of clinical supervision training, if I recall correctly, and one hour of ethics, um, but that those things are completed and that we, oh, the other thing was that um, we used to have supervisors that were brand spanking new clinicians and that did not even have two years of 
actual service under their belts. So now that is a new um, requirement of ASHA um, that, I, that I've noticed that says supervisors can't you know, be brand spanking new out of, un, out of college rather, and that they have to have a couple of years of actual service. So the other thing that I highlighted there is that they are credentialed to provide services both in the state they reside and in the states that they provide services. And remember the maps that I showed you before, the reason, one of the reasons why I showed you those maps was because I wanted you to understand that frankly, depending on your own preferences and whether or not you are interested, frankly, in doing intervention, um, excuse me, telesupervision um, across state lines, that those are the states that you want to look for. So I know that, you know, with shortages in certain areas and with maybe even financial opportunities that are available in other states, that again, the same um, version of telepractice is, um, is, is still in standing for telesupervision. So in other words, supervisors also, not just the clinical fellow, but the everybody <laughs> is working towards um, credentialing in the states that everyone is located in. So again, keeping in mind, there's the possibility that you might want to go across state lines. You need to make sure that you have licensure um, across that state line. Um, again, um, we should know um, once we get our license that it's different than getting our ASHA C's. And that could be one of the you know things that a lot of people argue. I myself am not in love with the idea that I have to be credentialed and licensed in different states to work across state lines um, because my work does take me across state lines and in fact takes me across international lines too. But as much as possible, we follow the rules and we um, find out what we need to do to be able to practice across state lines. And not everybody is, um, you know, makes you do, makes you jump through a million hoops to become credentialed. Some of them, you just fill out an application and pay the money and it's done. Some of them, they might require, you know, a little bit more documentation. And, um, and I, I, I want to believe, or I believe that some of them actually might have testing requirements within their own states. But again, keeping in mind, looking for both states from where you are, we are in New York to where we want to supervise, we can supervise across state lines. Um, and it says, as a reminder for the purposes of ASHA certification, clinical fellows have 48 months from the date of their CF experience from when they began to complete their experience. So 48 months, four years. One of the things that's also been part of our COVID-19 kind of um, awareness is that some student clinicians are not going, uh, some sorry, CFs are, and student clinicians, frankly, are not going to get uh, through their programs and through their, um, their licensure as quickly as um, in the past. So everybody was like, everybody says, or not everybody, excuse me, but we used to say clinical fellowship year. So we used to call it CFY. How many in, in the audience were CFY um, people? that you know, used to always be like, it's one year, clinical fellowship year. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Um, yeah, exactly. So it, that's the old way of thinking about things. It's now no longer that. It's clin clinical fellows, and then they have up to 48 months. So again, they have four years to do it, not just one. They shouldn't, they don't, I mean, most people don't want to. Just as a heads up, I wanted to make sure that I give you this um, information. Um, again, highlighted, and this is actually a question that came up. So if you're a supervisor now, you know, share it with, you know, anybody else um, that um, you must obtain 50% of the required supervised clinic, uh, so, blah, blah, blah. excuse me, January 1st to December 31st of this year, telepractice and telesupervision may be used to obtain up to 50% of the required supervised clinical practicum. So again, even for CFs, once again, um, that 50% uh, or, and most of the time I'm talking about student clinicians again. So I'm always thinking clinical practicum is really, you know, what I think of when I'm thinking on campus. Um, but because 
because ASHA has this regulation and because New York State doesn't have a specific regulation, this is one of the things that we kind of just follow along so that we don't get ourselves in trouble and we can always fall back on the, well, you didn't say anything that was like concrete, which is what New York has. And yet we followed the ASHA regulations and this is the reason why. So again, to give you some information. Um, and, and these are the kinds of things that we can do in you know, in, in our clinical supervision. Keeping in mind, um, especially at the bottom, when we um, think about our hours or clocking the hours, writing them down, making sure that they, you know, are, are properly documented. Activities such as planning, paperwork, and asynchronous therapy in this case. Um, again, this is because this is online, I'm sorry, in universities, so clinical practicum, cannot be counted. However, time spent in meetings with the patient family present, when the student is actively reporting evaluation results, treatment plans, progress can be counted since it is considered advising, educating, and training caregivers and families. So again, if you are doing CFs and you're thinking about what can be billed, right? What are some billing codes that make uh, sense to the, the hours, so to speak, um, of, of direct intervention at least? Um, those are the things that we're talking about. We're talking about um, the evaluation and the screenings, the treatment and the counseling with caregivers and families are the core of what we're doing. And yet additionally, um, certain things uh, such as being in meetings um, and talking about treatment plans um, can also be counted. So I hope that makes sense. Are there any questions about that? You're shaking your heads, but I can't see you. <laughs> Do you understand? Thumbs up. <laughs> cool, cool. All right. Good, good. Thank you. All right. And um, CAA, which is the Ac uh, Council for Academic Accreditation, so also under ASHA, CFCC is under ASHA. I should have written out what, they're, what they mean, right? Um, but I know that they are all about the C's. Um, the CAA um, also has standards for these universities, um, but they are not prescriptive about the use of telesupervision and telepractice. In other words, they don't make hard and fast rules and tell you what you absolutely need to do. The standards discuss what expectations are for supervision, but not how clinical practice and clinical supervision are provided via teleoptions. So again, how you do it is not directly monitored. So back to us talking about what type of telecommunication can be used and counted as telepractice and, telesuper and through telesupervision. We can you know, count a variety of different things, so that's kind of a good thing. It's, it's helpful, especially if you're doing um, sometimes, and again, I'm not, um, I'm not promoting things, but I know the truth of the matter. And the truth is that what, sometimes with student clinicians, things get a little glitchy. And sometimes we have to call the client and get the client to do X, Y, and Z. And um, even in the session, things, I, I know the other day I was having a meeting, the person could see me but I couldn't hear them. So they called me on the phone, but we kept the video camera on. So we were using the phone as well as the, um, you know, the Zoom link. So again, even in those ways, we're not, um, or we're not beholden, so to speak, to a, a specific way of doing it. This is also a benefit, right? So I'm telling you all the ways that they're kind of allowing for us to be the leaders, frankly, in what we're doing within the parameters of knowing that we need to maintain our license. We don't want to you know, lose um, our credibility and we want to provide good services that have good outcomes to our clients. So even though in these cases, the clients are working through our clinicians, our CFs or our student clinicians, we also know that this is definitely something that we have some flexibility about and that we can, um, you know, kind of make decisions as we go along. But also, I'm going to ask you 
um, as the audience and people that are out in the field to share what you're doing with others. Because the more we share, like I'm doing here, the more we know what is expected and what is being done through, you know, through throughout the, the field, at least in our areas and with our networks. So I do have that plea for you to talk and talk about what you're doing because um, we can set the tone and set how it flows. All right. So one of the biggest differences between graduate student and CF telesupervision is the percentage of time of direct supervision. Um, we have been told, <laughs> we have been told that we need to be available 100% of the time with student clinicians. How many of you have that, have that? That you know that you, if you are doing telesupervision with students on Zoom, online, that it's 100% of the time that you need to be available to them. So, you know, a lot of us are, are under that impression that we must do, you know, that with student clinicians and that we need to be 25% average with CFs. So in other words, obviously CFs have a job, they're getting paid and you visit them as it was said before, um, you know, a certain amount of time per the uh, breakdown of the units as they call them um, in the um, certification process. So 25% average, with CFs can mean a lot of time at the beginning and a lot of time at the end, but less time, um, you know, kind of in the middle that averages out to 25%. Now, to be honest, that is not ideal. We want to be able to have opportunities to observe them and talk to them. And they want us to give them the mentorship and the, the insight, the wisdom that you guys have that can take them to the next level, namely that they get their certification and their licenses and become proficient clinicians. So again, you know, as much as possible, we need to do more um, of the kind of like the breakdown across the time for the, for the clinical fellows, um, but 25% is average. With student clinicians, the, you know, we think we have to physically, you know, be in calling distance 100% of the time. And that's still actually on the ASHA books. So just as a heads up, in case you thought the normal version is 25% of attention that they get with online, we're giving them 100% being there, available in earshot, <laughs> hopefully watching. I'm not gonna say that you shouldn't watch your, you know, your student clinicians do their services. Um, so just, you know, obviously these are just uh, a couple of, um, couple of links that are um, helpful for you to be able to look at. I will show you what those are before, uh, let's see. I will show you what those are. This is going to be one of them. Oh, this one. The first one that I actually wanna show you is something that Asha, um, we, mm -mm. This is not it. I apologize. <laughs> but something that Asha recently um, wrote for the California, um, as it says, Asha support letter to California on the proposed RPE and telesupervision. And the reason why I wanted to bring this to your attention is because Asha, this date is September 16, 2022. Asha is able to make statements of support when we talk up. So once again, this is where why I said just a few minutes ago or a couple of minutes ago that I want you to share what you're doing and talk about it and go to your, um, you know, if necessary, go to your, go to Nishla, right? So the New York State Speech Language Hearing Association advocates on our behalf as professionals. If you go to the Nishla meeting, I, meetings, then you are going to hear what they're talking about. If you read the newsletter that comes in the mail and you're part of the um, you know, a membership, then you know what they're advocating for. So um, I know how many people here are part of Nishla and, and are, um, I would say members in good standing. <laughs> so <laughs> I know Terry is, Terry, you did a presentation for Nishla, so I know you, you're down. Anybody else? 
Okay, so I'm going to, not that I, you listen, I'm not on the initial board, but I do think that when it boils down to it, they have a voice that we don't have by ourselves. Oh, New Jersey, you okay, you're part of New Jersey. Got you, got you, got you, got you, got you. All right, and it looks like Abigail is also um, part of Nishla. So please join Nishla, um, and only because then you have a uh, New York and New Jersey. Got you, got you, Suzanne. Uh, only because you ha then have a say, right? And you can see, and you can hear, and you can know what's going on. So again, this is um, how Asha has responded. It was a pretty simple letter. Um, they were in support, as they said, of required professional experience, um, which is the RPE part of things. So again, if you, it's, it's, you know, kind of available for you to find. So looking at the fact that ASHA continues, has some say, and people want to have ASHA chime in. A lot of people complain that ASHA does not do enough. Make them do more. <laughs> say what you need to say, get the word out, and, and, and demand that they follow through. So again, you know, as we um, continue to you know, in New York, we have different other things that we're talking about, but this is something that California was interested in doing and wanted to apparently get Asha to say in it so that they could push forward and make it happen. Um, but I do encourage you to, to also do that for, for us in New York. Director of schools. I don't know, Abigail, what are, are you the director of schools? <laughs> and which schools? Yeah, um, for Nishla, I sit on the board. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so you understand, you get it. Yes. You, they, you know, they always are trying to encourage different people to, you know, us to continue to, you know, talk to people about membership. And uh, I think a lot of people don't know like that they have really, you know, that they, they have a say, they have some, some power, they have, um, you know, the opportunity to advocate for us. So when we're complaining about things, if we're complaining in our homes and to our friends and not, you know, out in, you know, out in the platforms that we need to be, having a seat at the table, come on sisters, we know, representation matters, having a seat at the table, talking to the right people who can advocate on our behalf or participating in that advocate, advo advocacy <laughs> ourselves, then, um, you know, we, we, we sell ourselves short, I'll say it that way. So again, you know, keeping that in mind, I wanted to make sure that I kind of re-encourage you to do that around telesupervision specifically. Um, the other thing is an article that was written in 2012. So it's just a resource and it has some decent information and I just wanted to put it out there um, for you to be able to see. So you can see that at another time because we're kind of running out of time. And then the last thing is really um, the, the other link that you had was the COVID-19 guidance um, from the CFCC. So, um, and again, this is where I got um, the information as I, you know, highlighted before. Um, so, you know, they have this link, uh, COVID guidance. They updated as as you know, pretty frequently. Um, the last time it was updated was March 2020. Actually, that's kind of a long time now, right? I guess COVID is kind of passe, <laughs> um, but either way, they have um, regulations that go all the way to December 31st, as I said before. So, you know, they still have um, opportunities or you still have opportunities to maintain, you know, these, these pieces of information in what you're doing with your, your student clinicians or your CFs. So, you know, again, going to this link, you know, be able to find out a lot more about what you're doing, how you're doing it, what's good, good practice, so to speak, and what other things you might need to improve upon.